Hi, this is TJ Welch, and welcome to another episode of Boston Rock and Roll Television. This is Sonic Lobotomy, and this is Full Powered Halo. We'll be with the 
with Full Powered Halo from Boston, Mass, USA. And uh, it's great to get a local band on that just is catchy as all hell. And you guys are. And you write some real real good ear candy. I love love the sound of it. Great performance. And uh, why don't we why don't we have you guys introduce yourself? We've got two of the band members here for, for the interview. Mike. Mark. There you go, Mike and Mark from Full Powered Halo, and, and how did that name come about? That's a real unique name, I like it. It's, it's not just a regular Halo, but it's, it's, it's blindingly bright, maybe, Full Powered. I, I think I came up with a, um, well, I, I saw somewhere, that, or I came up with a name, 100 Watt Halo, and uh, we, we were kicking around, you know, when you kick around band names, you write down 100 million different band names. And I came up with the name 100 Watt Halo, and I think Mike was like, you know, it should just be full power Halo. It's a lot better. No, Craig said. Oh, Craig, our original drummer. Then Chris, our friend Chris said, there is a 100 Watt Halo. You guys will get sued. Oh, really? Oh. <laughs> so we changed it. But well, we wanted to keep three words. Powered Halo. Yeah. yeah. And it kind of rolls off your tongue pretty full nice. Yep, full yeah. Full powered Halo. And you guys are certainly angelic. We are angelic. Yeah. Sherwood. Sherwood, the angelic band. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We did an original, we did two CDs a while back at Port Apache, which isn't there anymore in Cambridge. Oh, great studio. Yeah. yeah. 
Great studio in uh, great sound, actually. Both records sound pretty good for where we were at at the time. He's a three piece Absolutely. and pretty young, uh, young musicians and doing our best. But we're still playing a lot of those songs off those first two original records. And then we've written four or five new songs that we performed with uh, the new guys. So, but uh, breaks my heart. Yeah, it breaks my heart. Condescend are old songs that we've been playing for a while. Mark and I as a three piece and now four guys. Uh, One Penny was actually a song that was on FNX and WBCN for a little while. Um, we kind of peaked a little bit. We played Matchbox 20 at the Paradise. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was a fun, sold-out show. And we played with Dada. Dada. Yeah. Remember, I'm going to we Disneyland. Dada and oh, Y yeah. Store. We played with a bunch of 90s bands. Y like, Store. Yeah. Yeah. There was a couple others in there, too, actually. Yeah. I can't think of who they were right now. but um, Breaks My Heart, is that uh, addressed toward any... Uh, Particular uh, person or who wrote the lyrics? I did. I actually, I, I, you know, Mike and I write most of our stuff together. But uh, the lyrics for that one breaks my heart. It was actually it's about my mom and my sister yeah. in their relationship and if how uh, like when my like when they would fight about things, it would just as uh, you know, is the one watching it. I feel so bad about them fighting because they were just so alike, you know, in so many ways. So yeah, you know, it's like you know. Breaks my heart traditionally. Oh, this girl left me, but it was just about my mother and sister fighting, really, and being sensitive to it. <laughs> That's all it is. That's right? cool. Hey, I mean, yeah. it's, there's all all sorts of ways to get your heart broken. <laughs> you know, by family members as well as uh, lovers. Yeah. Right.
the formation of the band? How'd you get together? Well, you, Mark, had a drummer named Craig Barslow together, and they were looking for a bass player. I just started playing some music and came in. And yeah, cool. We got along well, and yeah. I didn't know what I was doing at first, but it was kind of fun. Was it your first band? Mark? First band, yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, started writing some songs together and uh, uh, playing some shows. I was working at the clubs in Boston, and I had met uh, a couple people from Somerville and. Lance Green. Lance Green, who was friends with Mike. And he said, you know, I got a friend that really wants to be in a band, and, you know, he's got a bass and a guitar. I'm sure he played bass if you guys are looking for a bass player. He started on a bass. Now we've switched Mike to guitar and put the bass in, but Mike originally played bass in the original three-piece of Full Power Day. So you started out as a three-piece. Yeah. How many years ago was that? Ten, twelve? Yeah, yeah more than that. Yeah. Ten or twelve-ish. Ten or twelve-ish. Yeah. Well, the other guys in the band aren't here, but uh, who else is in the band? So let's talk about them while they're not here. Exactly. Uh, Dave Scott, bass player. Very good bass player. Yeah. And uh, Anthony, Anthony Aubrey on drums. Yeah, nice. And you guys are a tight unit. As that unit, how long have you been, been playing together? Just over a year. Yeah, just about a year. Yeah, nice. it's, we started as a three-piece, but the recordings we do with a lot of um, harmonies and a lot of yeah. Guitars, leads, and then we needed a second guitar player, so I just switched to rhythm guitar and sang, concentrated on singing, Mark concentrated more on the guitar player. It's got two really good musicians in, bass player and drummer. Yeah, you certainly did. So, it's coming along pretty good. Yeah, I can understand that. You want to be able to pull it off live, what you did in the yeah. studio. Yeah. Exactly. And most of your songs have distinct leads and rhythm parts. Yeah. And, of course, the big, big harmonies. Yeah, yeah, they both sing harmonies very well, too, so... Yeah, it blends together so nice. Far, so, good. so we have four four people that can sing in the band, which I think is a rare, rarity, especially yeah. for a local band. It's usually two or three people that like, I just don't want to sing. No one cares, everyone in this band sings. <laughs> Since 
that other song that you were talking about that got some airplay on BCN, uh, One Penny. One Penny. Yeah. One Penny, actually, I the first song I wrote, and I brought it in short mark, and I just recorded it on like a record uh, tape player, and they did the harmonies and stuff, but... It was actually four track. No, yeah, no, no, no. This no, is no. what Carter does. This is even better. This is what Carter does. <laughs> like he, he's radio a genius with the microphone. He's got an old boombox. Record yeah. on that, and then you record it again. And then yeah. I play it and sing the harmonies on it. On a different tape boombox. recorder. Oh, that's cool. And so then sing the harmonies, and then I'd have the tape, and then I'd go back and put that tape in, and then do the bass. And so our home studio is essentially two boomboxes. We'll play the guitar and sing, and then play that tape back. And sing a harmony or play another guitar part over what we play back, so yeah. that there are different tracks on. Now that's overdubbing. Yeah, yeah. we're overdubbing. That's that's one actually, was, and, and when when I wrote that, I when we recorded at Fort Apache, I, we were listening. I was like Buffalo Tom and Lemonheads at the time. Yeah, pop music. And I saw Chris from Buffalo Tom in Davis Square yeah. at uh, a record store, and I, hey Chris, and I we gave him the CD and said, hey, <laughs> listen, to, you know, I didn't want you to listen to this song. Oh yeah, I'm sure he threw it away. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. they were a good band, huh? Yeah, very good. Buffalo yeah. Tom was great.
favorite bands uh, is Iron Maiden. I love them, man. I just and I got three little boys, and, and you know we put on uh, you know Run to the Hills, and they just start bouncing around the room. Uh, and the singer Bruce Dickinson from Iron Maiden has what a cousin or a brother or something who's in a band nephew? called the Catherine Wheel. Yeah, the his name's Dickinson too, right? Yes. Rob. Yeah, Rob. and uh, Catherine Wheel was one of the better bands in the '90s. They probably are they still around? Unfortunately, no. not. Yeah. yeah, but they're a big, they're a big influence on you guys yeah. and your sound. Yeah, yeah. And, and you kind of you, you decided to cover one of their their better songs. Delicious, yeah. delicious, which is probably about a girl, right? I'm guessing. It could be about food. <laughs> I'm guessing it's about a girl. I, mean, they I know we recorded it at Brian Adams' studio in Canada, in Vancouver, and that's his wife on the recording. Brian oh, Adams' really? wife. Uh, Brian uh, Adams. Yeah, huh? Dave Scott does the nice little chick harmonies. Yeah, and the, the chick part when we when we do the cover. So. Do you guys think you record that, that, that for a CD or do you Maybe. Know, I don't know. We, never, we never thought about that. That's okay. actually a good idea because no one knows it's their song. You yeah. always kind of make a joke out of it. If you, you know, if you don't know this one, we wrote it. Like, <laughs> you know, and everyone knows like Black Metallic, or, right? Yeah. Or, uh, or uh, Crank. That's yeah, the other one that people know is yeah. Crank and Black Metallic. So if, if if you ever hear Delicious being played, we play it. and You don't know it, then we wrote it. Yeah, it's an original. It's an original. Power Halo song. <laughs> is a big word and usually negative connotations yeah um, you know it's a type of a character that condescends looks down on people yeah um, that's one of your your earlier songs right it is yeah it is um, it's funny I can tell you every single song where we ripped it off from every single song is a rip off of something else hey that's rock and roll exactly where did it's, it come from this one was an, like kind of an oasis rip off to come from some might say by oasis and we changed the chords around a little bit Mike and I like let's do oasis ad nauseum in the 90s yeah, and um, we're like, well, let's write a song like Oasis, and we we just flip the chords a little bit here and there. So we wrote Condescend, and it was basically uh, I wrote the lyrics to that one, I think, and I think it was just like, you know, talking about 
how everyone's got their opinion, but some people just try to force it on you. Yeah. yeah. So, condescend is, you know, here's some advice for you, motherfucker. Excuse me. Yeah, yeah hey. <laughs> That's a good subject matter for a song. It is. Yeah. It's always a good song, you know. It's like just the same as like my generation by the Who, you know. Yeah. yeah. It's like don't don't tell us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I found myself. I think I found myself. I think I found myself today. I seem to have no choice. I think I lost my voice. Can't scream out my name. same time as when you wrote Finger in the Socket. Yeah, Finger in the Socket, whatever that is, right around the same time. Whatever that is was more of uh, the drums. I heard the drums. It's got a machine gun drum in it. Yeah, you built it from the rhythm up. Yeah, yeah. and uh, wrote the bass line, wrote the, had the idea for the drum, showed it to the drummer at the time, Anthony. I mean, uh, Chris. Chris. Uh, Ventilari. Ventilari. And he got it and picked up on it, boom, and we showed him. Anthony got in the band, we showed him, and he's, he's added on to it. But uh, same thing, like hard driven drums, bass line, build up, and uh, some good old harmonies. Yeah. We try to get that live too, so. It's infectious, you know, all, all your songs, by the time you hit the chorus, they stick in your head. That's what we're looking for. 
it's it's kind of in, in my opinion it's it's power pop you know it's uh cheap, the best of you know like cheap trick or something like that it's it, it, it's it's hard but it's also um, uh, got good melodies and good harmonies that really suck you in our uh, motto is don't bore us get to the chorus what do you think you think the uh, Bruins will win a Stanley Cup in our lifetime that's a tall order man but you know if you'd asked me Ten years ago, if the Patriots and the Red Sox were ever going to do it, I'd have my doubts. Yeah. You know, based on um, the way the ownership was in, in both of those teams, and I, I think the Bruins, you know, I, I got to hand it to them—they've they, tried a little harder to to make some moves and do things that they traditionally never did before. So I, I you know, I, I got to say positive on them too. Uh, you know. I just want a U.S. hockey victory. Oh yeah. oh yeah, me too. Yeah. They awesome. came damn close this last Olympics. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the U.S. hockey team. That's what I'm the biggest hockey fan. Every four years, the Olympics, man, they go yeah. crazy. Well, American, the, the caliber of American hockey players has got much higher yeah. in recent years, you know. And it's uh, it's inevitable that 1980 will happen again. That's right. That's right. Even though I'm retired. Oh yeah, you retired <laughs> hockey. <laughs> Did you I'm retired hockey? football. He's retired oh, yeah. hockey. Yeah. Finger in the socket. That's uh, who, what, who wrote that one? 
Mm-hmm. Mark and I wrote together, um, wrote it actually right after we finished Fort Apa- the Fort Apache sessions in, uh, well, I was, had a rough night one night. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, the <laughs> lyrics pretty much say that story. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you were in the car with side swipes with uh, he was in the car with two relatively Matt, famous Matt Ellard and uh, Matt Ellard from Port Apache and uh, Chris Slade no Sean um, uh, I did the super drag record uh, he, produced, he super produced regretfully he was my super drag oh, but yeah. he was just happened to be there the last day of recording yeah. oh Sean so it's was. a blackout situation so sort Carter, of, yeah. Carter was in the in the car with two <laughs> people that Locally, we're very Sean O'Hare. Sean O'Hare. Sean O'Hare. Sean O'Hare. I don't know if he wants that name. So no, nah, maybe yeah. not. But Sean, call, yeah, okay. a guy named Sean and a guy named Matt, who right, were both you. local, very well known record producers slash engineers. Two very you know respected producers slash engineers in the Boston and somewhat national music scene. Cotto was in his car with them, driving him home late one night, having. Had a few drinks. I'm not gonna say what town we were in. Sideswiped a few cars. Had, had a few yeah. I don't yeah, you mentioned that in the song. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it was yeah. just a night of debauchery and uh, you know finger in the sock. It just like you know a yeah. euphemism for you know getting wasted and, and yeah. hoping for the best. Yeah. I got yeah. my finger in the sock and I could die. I might not. Didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't. Thank so. God. Yeah. Well, now what do we do without them? You've got two CDs out. How does one get a hold of these CDs? Are they uh, on iTunes? Or? No, you gotta actually get it on iTunes. Yeah, we should. Yeah, um, you can get come to a show and ask. Yeah, me. It's, come to a show. Right we'll, we'll give you the newest one because we it's a demo. We still have a couple of the old ones kicking around. I do actually. Yeah. Yeah. I have the red CD still. Yeah, but um, you can just go to Facebook Full Power Halo. Facebook Full Power yeah. Halo. Yeah. yeah, and friend us. Maybe. Friend us. Write write us an email or something. I'll try and get one. We can let you know.
Jamestown. That's uh, what about the early settlers uh, <laughs> down in Virginia? Exactly. 1600s. Yeah. Historical song. Pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much it is. Um, is it? No. no wrote it down <laughs> in Jamestown, Rhode Island. Oh, okay. That's where I wrote went it. Down by Guitar, and uh, it was that a beautiful house in Rhode Island, friends' house, and we just started writing the song. Yeah. It came out good, and then we played it, and they, these guys liked it. And so that's one of the new newer songs that's yeah. not on one of your CDs. Yeah, it's yeah. not out. We haven't recorded that yet. And what's that one about? It's not really about anything. I think if I could say something about his songwriting, I think he's he's a great songwriter. But he he writes. Yeah, he mentioned earlier, early in the band, he didn't, he didn't know what he was doing, and you know, I think you know, still don't. <laughs> there you go. And I think sometimes he, he works a lot on instinct. He still doesn't know what he's doing. A rapper. He's a rapper. He just kind of he knows what sounds good. And he, yeah. Uh, just let the words flow. Let the words flow. And let the let the let the funk flow, so to speak. And he he does th- that very well. And you know, you don't even know what he's writing about half the time. He just writes words that sound good together, and they they have some kind of emotional meaning to him somewhere. There, I'm sure, because they wouldn't be any good if. If they didn't have some emotional meaning, yeah, you know, to, it, it, but I don't even think he knows what the. Well, then I show him and I say, I need this lead part. I want this to be lead guitar driven, and then he'll come up with the great lead guitar part. So, yeah, yeah. Which I couldn't do, so it's part of good song right here. The yeah. pieces fit so, together yeah. nicely. Yeah, we do. And your drummer's real good with the rhythms, you know. Good with the rhythms and harmonies. And Dave, we show Dave, and Dave's like picks up on it, writes great bass lines, and he'll come up with different harmony ideas. Dave actually arranges a lot of the stuff too. Like the newest stuff we're doing, will come in and be like this, this, this. That's half the battle too, yeah. arranging. You know what I mean? Yeah. If it wasn't for that, all our songs would be ten minutes long. You know? Yeah. 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 Chop out the yeah. yeah, that's good.
Dying to Forget You? Yeah, Dying to Forget You. What's uh, is that a new, that's a newer one, right? Newer one, yeah. We, that uh, we actually recorded. We have a recording of that. Yeah, we did. We recorded that actually at your place. Oh, my cellar, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. We demoed it. And um, it's basically a love song. Yeah. You know, uh, Dying to Forget You. Uh, you know, just wanting to uh, get past the relationship that you had or something. And the song's got a nice dynamic. It's got the quiet part with the harmonic guitar. Yeah, a little, the little yeah. bass kind of hangs all on that bass line. And then it explodes in the yeah. chorus. Yeah, it's, it's a nice... Go nice for that song. 90s quiet, quiet, loud thing. Yeah, it works, you know. What are, what are some of your other influences? What do you guys uh, uh, listen influences. to? What do you like now? Did, did we, before we uh, set up to do this interview, you had some uh, new stuff on by... Uh, Fitz and the Tantrums. Fitz and the Tantrums. Fitz and the Tantrums are great. Great harmony. Yeah. Oh. And they don't use a guitar. I'm so impressed by that. It's a great yeah. soul act. And, you know, um, what else recently? I, I love stereophonics. He's a big stereophonics guy. They're uh, big in England, right? They, yeah, yeah, everywhere except here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> pretty yeah. much. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm a I'm a sucker for the classics. I'm a firm believer that you never really, you're only influenced by what you liked as a kid. So. You know, you give me Nirvana, The Clash, Motorhead, ACDC all day long, that's what I'm going to care about. That's yeah. really all, all the stuff that I care about. But there are obviously great bands past that point. But for me, it stopped mattering after 1996, and that's kind of where I draw all my influences from. But I still listen to stuff today and think it's great, obviously. Yeah, being a musician, yeah, you, you, you have stimulation. To, that's right, that's right.
Jesus.